All right, so tonight we're going to be talking about treatment planning and SMART goals. So um, as you know, we've been working through all, basically, a majority of the 12 core functions for AOD counselors, and we've talked about a lot of these already. And tonight our focus is on treatment planning. And if you'll recall, in the beginning of the semester, and I've mentioned it several times, one of the things that, that I have really stressed is the golden thread, right? The golden thread. And the golden thread begins at screening, right? So that's when the client calls in and says, hey, they're looking for a program, right? So even at screening, this is where treatment planning begins. So uh, we're going to be looking for, is there an issue that requires treatment? So if you're a substance use disorder program, obviously what you're going to be looking for is, do they meet the criteria initially or a, enough of a criteria to warrant treatment, right? Then once they're accepted into your, your program, um, that's when the assessment phase comes in. And this is usually done beginning on day one, um, usually the first couple of weeks. And this is where we're collecting the information in order to formulate a treatment plan. I know earlier in the semester, I talked about assessments like the behavioral health assessment, uh, which an LPHA may do. And remember, LPHA is a master's level clin clinician. Um, but also, as a substance use disorder counselor, you may be doing assessments, for instance, such as the um, Addiction Severi Severity Index, right? The ASI. Um, and you're going to be looking at things like how severe is the substance use disorder. You're going to be looking at things like readiness for treatment. In other words, what stage of change they're in, right? Uh, one of the reasons why I had you write that paper uh, was to kind of get you into thinking about whenever you're looking at your client, um, what stage of change are they in? Why do you think they're there? What is the evidence of it, right? Um, you're also going to do a co-occurring screening. You're going to be looking for available resources. You know, <coughs> excuse me. Um, also, referring them to if, if needed, to the appropriate care setting. And then, of course, looking at their strengths and supports and if there's any cultural or linguistic needs. So, um, so basically, treatment planning is a collaborative process. And this is important. Whenever it comes to treatment planning, um, uh, it's really, really important that, even, that it's collaborative. Um, and that when you're writing your notes about it, that you're really um, talking about the collaboration. Um, so, and the reason why that's coming up for me, I, I you know, remember in a couple of the papers when, um, for the TTM, when sometimes people would use language like, well, I will tell the client to do this, right? Or I would do you know, I would have the client do that. And I understand where you guys are coming from there. And I would make some notes in that. Um, you really want your language to be more collaborative because the client doesn't have to do anything we tell them, right? So if we're really client centered, it's their plan, it's their goal. Um, and that will come up again later in, in this uh, presentation. So I just thought I'd hit on it now. There but is an, there? yes. Are we supposed to be seeing something up on the screen right now? You cannot see anything? I can. I cannot. It just says Professor Grandstaff has started sharing screen. OK, that could be a connectivity issue on your end. Let's see. Is anybody else having problems? It looks like every, I'm getting everyone else that can see it. So um, yeah, I, I'm sorry, this is being recorded. So you will be able to, to, to view it later um, and re-enjoy this conversation. <laughs> All right. I have a question. Yes. Um, so in the, you just described this, we, we shouldn't, we, we wouldn't say, I would tell the client to do such and such. So give us a, a, a 
are you, would you, can you uh, give us an example? Yes, I'll give you an example. Actually, there's an example that came to my mind from a paper that I recently read. So uh, actually, it was one of the uh, burp notes, I think. I think it was a burp note. Yeah, it was a burp note. So Dr. Curtis and Fabian, they were working together on those positive affirmation reminder cards. Remember that? And um, in the video, you see, um, yes, Dr. Curtis is a little directive in the beginning, but to kind of provide some psychoeducation and help Fabian develop it. And he even reframed one of Fabian's statements, right? But that's all appropriate uh, intervention. Um, but they collaborated on it together. And I think what one of the things that I had read, and I, uh, so I'm going to paraphrase, was that um, Dr. Fabian gave him reminder cards, or Dr. Fabian told him to do X, Y, and Z with the reminder cards. And if you look at the video, what's actually happening is there is a collaboration happening. And so um, I would say, you know, Dr. Curtis collaborated with Fabian in the creation of reminder cards. Fabian agreed to read the reminder cards three times per day for the next seven days, something to that effect, right? So that it shows more of it being client-centered rather than counselor-directed. Does that make sense? So that, that's kind of what I was referring to. Thank you. And the, and the same thing happens in treatment planning. So if you'll recall when we were talking earlier in the semester, one of the things that is required by Drug Medi-Cal is that all clients that come into any substance use disorder program um, in San Diego County are required to show proof that they've had a physical exam within the past 12 or within 12 months. So it could be, you know, 10 months before they got there. If they can show the exam, they've met the criteria for drug Medi-Cal, right? If they haven't, then while they're here in the program, we need to refer them to a doctor to, um, to do the, to do the, um, uh, to do the physical. Often what I have seen over the years is people write treatment plans, and here's the problem that I've seen people write in their treatment plans. The doctor, the medical director of the, of the facility, has been unable to view the, the client's uh, most recent physical. Does anybody see a problem with that? as being a problem area on a treatment plan? Wouldn't that be our responsibility to do the case management to make, to make sure we get the information in order to contact a primary care guy and get the client to sign the release and then get the primary care office to send a copy to our yeah. Medical director. Yeah, all of that. So basically, that's not a client-centered problem. That's a program-centered problem. <laughs> and a program-centered problem really doesn't belong on a treatment plan. Now, there are ways to collaborate with the, with the client to get the client's needs met, regards to their physical health, and also get the program's needs met but you really want it to be client-centered. So what I often do or have done in the past when working with a client is I'll discuss their health history with them. It's part of the assessment process anyway. And they might say things like, you know, I'm really worried, you know, I, you know, I, I haven't been very safe while I was out there or I practiced unprotected sex or I um, shared needles, right? All of these things are health-related. Well, bingo, right there. That's a reason to do all that case management that Joel just referred to. And now we can put that on the treatment plan because the client is now expressing concern about their own health. 
So instead of just saying, oh, well, we have to put this on the treatment plan and write it any way we want and basically kind of tell the client, hey, you kind of got to do this. Um, that's not really collaborating. So that's kind of what I was referring to. And I hope that that makes sense. So the words we use and the way we define problems on treatment plans um, is really important. It's crucial. And a good idea to have on each problem section is a quote from the client as, as how they view the problem, right? So, and we'll talk about that as we move forward here. Um, so we wanna work and set treatment goals that address the problems as identified during the assessment process. I, I kind of just gave an example of that, right? Um, you also wanna make sure that you're prioritizing short-term goals in orders of, of importance. And here's the other thing about that. Client may have a really big long-term goal um, and that's not necessarily inappropriate, but in treatment planning, we get to help the client break up that big goal into a series of short-term goals that helps him meet, you know, his end game. Does that make sense? So sometimes working with the clients, um, uh, Well, it's just important to do that and um, it, it builds rapport. Um, and it's not saying that you can't provide them psychoeducation. Hey, have you ever thought of, you know, how your uh, substance use disorder has affected your health? When's the last time you've been to the doctor? When's the last time you've been to the dentist? You know, you can use um, um, motivational interviewing techniques to raise consciousness and then get them to um, define a problem for their treatment planning. Because if you sit down with a client and say, okay, what do you want to work on? You know what they're going to tell you? I don't know. And they're, and they're, and they're right. So our, our job is to kind of help guide them, right? All right. Uh, let's see here. There it is. All right. So there are five stages of treatment planning. So let's just start going through them. So the first stage is you always want to address any immediate concerns that come up. So you get a person that comes in and they're expressing suicidal ideation, homicidal ideation. There might be uh, some mandated reporting issues going on. They may need a higher level of care, right? So, um, so that's the first area. That's the first stage. So making sure that you um, have addressed any immediate concerns. Now, not everybody comes in with SIHI, right? So um, you may pass this stage. Well, actually, technically you don't, because if you're doing your assessments and you're doing them appropriately, you're already assessing for all of this. And if it comes up, that's the first thing that gets addressed in treatment planning. If it doesn't, then you're going to the next level, right? Which is <coughs> you're continuing your assessments, you're looking at their biopsychosocial history, any diagnoses that they're working with, um, and you're gonna help them set goals and provide their initial interventions. So I'll give you an example. Like my program here, we're a minimum of 18 months. And the reason why I say a minimum is because um, sometimes people, because um, uh, they're all justice involved, they're all on probation. They may be here longer than that. But for us, an initial uh, intervention is going to be on that first treatment plan, which is going to be developed within 30 days of them arriving here. By the way, if you do residential, it's within 10 days. Um, but I'm just using my outpatient experience as an example right now. And then the initial interventions are going to be described on their first 90-day treatment plan. Um, and again, in residential, the difference is, is treatment plans are done every 30 days. So there is the difference. But, it's the, but we're still talking about the same thing. Um, it's just an outpatient. It's just a longer time period. So you're going to be doing that in the second stage. In the third stage, this is where you're actually 
um, conducting the treatment, doing case management um, with the idea that we're re reducing symptoms. Remember S, capital S, little x, um, lowercase x is uh, shorthand for symptoms or symptom, I should say. Um, you're going to be making referrals. You're going to be helping them to increase their efficacy. Um, and then also, this is also a constant thing, right? So as they're progressing through treatment, you're going to be looking, um, evaluating, and adjusting the treatment plan as needed, as, as determined by the client's progress. Um, and then, of course, there's always consultation, right? Remember the old phrase, seek supervision before supervision seeks you. The fourth stage is um, relapse prevention planning. And the idea here is you're increasing insight into the development of the client's issues, um, preparing the client to cope with future problems. In other words, the what if scenarios. Um, and you're also, and this is periodically, this should be done periodically, reviewing the progress toward treatment goals and reviewing that with the client. Uh, and then a connection to resources and community services. Um, and this may be a continuation of what you've did earlier in the stages of treatment planning. And then five is termination, right? So this might look like, um, somebody uh, going into aftercare, uh, but they're ending treatment. The other thing I like to do with termination is transition is something that in my experience um, in, the, in the facilities that I've worked in and the programs I've worked in, a lot of clients begin to experience unaccepted, uh, not unaccepted, unexpected is the word I was trying to say, unexpected feelings about termination. They may all of a sudden become fearful. Uh, they may want to slow down on their progress because um, uh, that transition can be difficult for clients. And so as counselors, we need to kind of be prepared uh, to see that and also prepare the client for termination. And we'll talk about that further. All right. All right, so here's the early stage, immediate concerns. So this is where you're gonna be evaluating the person's risk factors, right? What's their level of danger to themselves or to others? Um, do they have any legal obligations? Uh, do they require a medical detox, right? When you know, determining when they might need medical detox or medical supervision. Do they need residential? Do they need uh, uh, intensive outpatient, right? So you're looking at these things. Um, here's the other thing that's really, really important. Be sure that you as an SUD counselor are practicing within your scope of practice and competency. Um, this is really important uh, because you don't want to get yourself in trouble and you don't want to cause any harm to the client. Um, and that could also cause you some legal is issues as well, right? Or some ethical issues. But make sure you're practicing within your, your scope of practice. Um, if if a client presents with a situation, I'll give you a perfect example. Um, there have been a couple of times where I have had clients that have presented with eating disorders. That is not within my competency. Um, and so I've had to make those referrals out. And eating disorders is one of those that is, uh, that's kind of complicated. Um, and, and I know some um, eating disorder um, therapists, right, uh, clinicians, and they've received specialized training. Um, there's, there's a whole niche just for that. Well, I recognize for myself that, that that's not within my competency. And so it would 
probably be inappropriate for me to even try to address that other than looking at needing re, re, uh, referrals and you know sending them forward. The other thing that's really important is that your clients are well informed and that you discuss your limits of confidentiality with them. I always say a happy, an informed client is a happy client. I believe in being transparent. So you're going to identify the presenting problem, you're establishing your rapport, you're addressing the issues related to trust and boundaries, rules and regulations, and of course the client's motivation. So you're looking at all of this stuff in the early stages. And all of this may end up on treatment plans. <clears throat> all right. So I'm gonna kinda through this, all right. So uh, I kinda said this earlier, you're gonna conduct a biopsychosocial um, an ASI, if your program uses ASIs, an ASI is basically a biopsychosocial. Um, it addresses lots of um, uh, life areas, right? Um, making those appropriate referrals. Uh, you're going to be providing SUD education and also treatment options. Um, and this is also very important that you are uh, integrating the assessment into diagnoses and then developing a case conceptualization. So the paper you guys just turned in regarding the, the uh, DSM-5 diagnosis where you, it was the three paragraph scenario that I told you guys to do. The first, first paragraph, you're basically identifying your client, what's their presenting issue then the next paragraph, you're writing out what is their diagnosis? What criteria are they meeting? And what is the evidence that they're meeting that criteria? And then the third paragraph is, okay, so what, what referrals are you going to do? Um, how does the client react to this? Um, what treatment planning issues may come up, right? So that's kind of like a, a mini version of a case conceptualization, which is why I had you guys do that, to kind of get you in that mindset. Um, all right. Okay, so I kind of said this earlier, I don't want to beat a dead horse. Um, but you're going to co construct the treatment plan, you and the client. So you should never create a treatment plan, and then have the client come in, <clears throat> sit down and sign it. Treatment plans should be um, other than maybe a skeleton, you know, of prompts, there's, that's okay to have a template prompt, you know, or format. Um, but as far as ex explaining problem areas, goals, and action steps, that stuff should be created between, with the client, you guys in the same office working together. Um, <clears throat> And so that's what we mean by co-construct or collaborate on that, all right? Um, the client gets a say in prioritizing their goals and objectives. Um, now programs now are using the ASAM criteria. Um, we, I did not get a chance to go over the ASAM criteria like I wanted to this semester, um, but that helps also prioritize right? What's their recovery environment look like? What's their readiness for change? Are there any medical issues that need addressing, right? All of those things are part of the ASAM criteria. And um, you would use that in your treatment planning. All right. All right, let's talk about the middle stage. So they've been here for a while, they might have gone through one treatment plan. Now you have another treatment plan that's coming up. You may be looking at, uh, uh, you know, how their progress has been. Um, how are we going to be reducing their core symptoms? What interventions are we going to use that target thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, right? So, you know, like cognitive behavioral therapy, um, moral recognition therapy, um, that's for justice involved clients. Um, rational emotive behavior therapy, which is a cousin of um, CBT. 
cognitive behavioral therapy, that kind of stuff. You're going to be looking at those types of interventions. Um, you're also going to, and not only through treatment planning, but the also through counseling groups, all the other interventions that they um, that they're going through while in treatment is basically designed to identify and strengthen their ability to cope. What are their current problems? Um, what coping skills, strengths, resiliency do they have, right? Um, sometimes we call that resourcing, right? We, we try to help the client discover their own resources. How are we addressing relapses or future problems, right? Um, and so some interventions we might be using is modeling, which is where social model programs come from, right? Psychoeducation, be doing some role playing, problem solving skills, um, refusal skills, right? Contingency planning, um, parenting classes or assertiveness training. All of these things would be part of that. And then <clears throat> getting back to ASAM dimension six, which is the person's recovery environment. This is another area where we would want to, um, to help them increase their social support, right? So that they have a support group around them that, uh, that helps kind of carry them along in the same direction. All right, so we're also looking at increasing their self-esteem and self-efficacy, right? So self-esteem, how they feel about themselves and self-efficacy, um, their belief and their ability to, um, to solve their own problems, right? Like, I can do this. Um, again, this is emphasis on um, reinforcing their, uh, their strengths that have already been identified, <clears throat> breaking things down into achievable tasks for the client. We'll talk about that when we get to SMART goals in the, at the end of this. Um, and then provide opportunity for practice and for them to, and for positive feedback, right? All right. Also addressing environmental and family um, factors, right? Acculturation issues, family dynamics. Um, I know a lot of programs will have, like we have um, what we call family night. Of course, because of COVID-19, we've had to, uh, to uh, stop doing that for the time being, but we'll get back up to that, right? Involving family if, the, if we can do that, if it's appropriate, because it's not always. But then also helping the client to, um, uh, to navigate uh, those acculturation issues or family dynamics. And then of course, providing opportunities for re uh, rehearsal, um, sometimes known as behavioral rehearsal or role play, um, practicing uh, communication skills. You can do that in individual session. Group settings are another great place to do that. And then the other thing is to examine transference and counter-transference. And you'll notice it says consult next to that. Um, whenever you're experiencing or, or, or whenever this comes up, always seek consultation. So who can tell me what is transference? When the client is transferring his uh, feelings and emotions onto the counselor. That is correct. What is counter transference? It's the opposite of that where the counselor is um, transferring his feelings onto the client, maybe through bias or some um, prior trauma or something like that. A similar experience that they um, transfer um, or, or a similar experience that they've experienced um, that they would um, share with the client, but it's kind of more based on the, the clinician's stuff instead of helping out the client. Yes, those are, um, you both nailed it, right? Um, and counter, you're, okay, so I'm just going to put it like this. You will experience countertransference. 
I guarantee it. Guarantee it. Uh, there's no one in this field that escapes it. Now, counter experiencing, having those feelings does not make you a bad counselor. It just makes you a human being. Um, the thing about counter transference, and there can be varying degrees to it, right? Um, it, it can be mild or it could be, uh, it could be way off the charts. <clears throat> Here's the problem with countertransference, and I'm going to use Crystal's example here uh, as an example of that. I think you guys have heard me say this before, but you cannot take a client past anything you haven't gone past yourself, right? You can only take a client as far as you've been. And um, this is why I also said earlier in the semester, get into counseling before you get into counseling, right? In other words, work on your own stuff before you start working with other people. Um, because there is a potential, a potential there of causing harm um, at worst. At best, maybe the the client is unaffected, but the treatment becomes ineffective because as a counselor, you're experiencing countertransference and now you're becoming ineffective, right? Um, I'll give you an example of, of something that, that I've experienced with another clinician. So there was a clinician that had experienced a trauma and this person had gone to counseling and they believed that they were okay. Then there is a client that experienced the exact same kind of trauma. And then the clinician, uh, because of experience countertransference, became over overprotective, uh, kind of crossed some boundaries, um, and wasn't able to see it for themselves that that they were actually doing this because in their mind oh i've gotten therapy uh, i know what to do i know what's best for this client well no you don't um yes you may have experienced the same trauma but what you're doing at the moment your object objectivity is blocked and you're at risk of causing harm um and this clinician actually experienced um, some emotional difficulties after that. And so it's just really, really important that, that if you have stuff, please work on your stuff. And that self-disclosure of your stuff to a client, especially if you're experiencing countertransference, is probably, I'll just tell you, I'll, I hope you hear this booming in your head for the rest of your lo professional lives, that uh, if you're doing it because of countertransference, you're actually trying to make yourself feel better, and that is inappropriate for the client. It's just inappropriate. So um, just be very, very careful. And I know in the drug and alcohol field, it is very common to... Uh, to self-disclose um, our recovery and, you know, and, and I'm not saying that there's never a place for that. There's been times where I have done that, right? But it's very targeted for a specific reason and I've documented it. What'd you say? I see you want to text me, you're done. Oh, what are you doing now? Okay, hold on one second. I just, so, my friend just dropped me off right now. Hold on, hold on. If everybody could mute themselves, Otherwise, you're going to be very popular on YouTube later. Okay, there you go. Because remember, this gets uploaded. All right. <laughs> Any questions on transference or countertransference or self-disclosure? All right. So then last, I'm going to say here on this slide, examine the treatment plan uh, so as to note the progress Right, and this should also be done in your uh, in in your session notes as well. Um, and then, if there's any adjustments, so if you remember in the burp note, right, 
<clears throat> uh, in the plan section, what does it say? Um, clients, uh, any new issues? Are there any new issues? Um, and that's an opportunity for you to note in your um, uh, in your progress note that hey, there, there we may need to examine the treatment plan. Um, so, all right. Uh, let's see here. Let me see where. All right. So in late stage uh, treatment, you know, this is where we're really beginning to focus on relapse prevention, um, how the client views themselves and, and uh, stuff like that, right? So what we wanna do is we wanna prepare the client to successfully cope with future problems. So let me ask you guys this question, since you guys have written your papers on the trans-theoretical model of change, and we've talked about stages of change. Why are we talking about relapse prevention here and not earlier? What do you guys think? Because the client may not be at a stage where he's, um, he or she is amenable to relapse prevention? Yeah, exactly. And, and I'll use this as an example of what we do here, which sometimes I'm, you know, I, I, gotta, I gotta admit, it's like, uh, I, I don't always see this as a good idea, right? So you get a brand new client, just got out of jail, um, first time of treatment, uh, maybe late pre-contemplation, early contemplation, or contemplation at best, right, ambivalence, and then we're going to tell them to create a relapse prevention plan because we're sticking them in a relapse prevention group. We've missed a few steps along the way, right? Um, so yeah, so our treatment is, is like stepping stones, right? We're kind of guiding the client one stage at a time, you know? Um, now, you have clients that come in and they might already be in preparation and you may assess, okay, you know what, let's, let's do some contingency management. Let's look at some relapse prevention thing. That may be perfectly appropriate, right? May be perfectly appropriate. Um, but there is a reason why relapse prevention is we're talking about it here as opposed to initially. Initially, we're getting to know the client. We're doing assessments. <clears throat> Any relapse prevention planning we do may be wrong, right? So just remember, you 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 kind of it's a stepping stone process. So good answer on that. Um, and here is where you're focusing on on strategies that help the client envision future problems. Um, I think some of you have been around for a while, and I can't remember who works in the field or and who doesn't. Um, but I'll just ask this question. Have you ever had a client or ever heard anybody say, yeah, I went out to the bar to test my recovery? Anybody ever hear anything like that? Yeah, I actually had a client today who had um, told me that he went out with some old friends and his wife because he wanted to see how he would be um, in that environment because he knows he's not going to like completely avoid bars forever. And so we just kind of explored that, you know, you're, you're still in pretty early recovery. You have about 30 days. Do you think that was a great idea? What would have yeah. happened? If you hadn't have had that self-control kind of just like playing the tape forward a little bit, but it's always really interesting when they think that it's appropriate to test themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's an excellent conversation that you had. Um, go ahead. Next voice. Yeah. I was just, uh, this is Curtis. I was just saying that, um, I've had several of them in residential treatment setting before COVID when they were going out during the day. And one in particular who happened to be a peer leader in the community um, specifically said that he went out to test how he felt. And ironically, um, within about 15 days, he relapsed and was out of the program. Yeah, yeah. You know, and what I have found is that when people do that, they're actually testing the wrong thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it gives them a false sense of security. Yeah, I got this beat. Yeah, I got this. Now, getting back to um, the first example, 
that was used about going out to the bar with the family and only got 30 days. I'm not saying that we don't do that. Um, because part of relapse prevention that I like to use is also what's known as trigger extinction. And anybody here heard of trigger extinction? Yes. Okay. Yay. So yay. I was hoping somebody did. Or Pavlov's dogs. Um, if you take my psychology course, well, when I'm teaching it in person, um, I'm not doing that this semester. I mean, I'm teaching it, but not in person. Um, but when we come to the learning chapter and we talk about classical conditioning, triggers are all about classical conditioning. And it's all about learning. Triggers are learned and they can be unlearned. Um, so that may be something that you might work with a client on. Now, don't get me wrong. We are not sending Johnny back out to the crack house so that he can, ex you know, have trigger extinction with cocaine, right? Um, that's not what I'm talking about. But say you have a client that likes to go to concerts or as an example, um, is that client never going to go to a concert again? No, they're going to go to a concert. It's going to be part of their future life. So let's have them slowly ease into that in a safe manner so that when they end up there and smell the marijuana or see the drinking, that they're not triggered. And there are ways to do that. So, um, and you would talk about that with relapse prevention. And there are three phases of of trigger extinction. First one is avoidance of the trigger for whatever period of time is necessary for the client. Then gradual and safe reintroduction of that. Um, and you do that for as long as it needs to happen for it to no longer be a trigger to where they no longer respond to it. So I always tell clients, for, uh, recovery is not about not using drugs or alcohol. It's really not. It's about freedom from triggers. If you're free from triggers, you're not going to want the drugs or alcohol. And if you do some other work too, it's, I'm being very simplistic right now. And we all, we all know there's a lot of other work as evidenced by everything we've talked about in these slides. But, um, but that's how I present trigger extinction to clients at the appropriate time. So getting back to the first one, maybe that might be something on a future treatment plan later on. Don't go back and tell your program manager that. They're going to say, your teacher is a nut. <laughs> I promise I won't. <laughs> <laughs> but I but also it, find that when they're overconfident is a like, severe sign of the concern for me, at least, is when they're floating on this pink cloud of like, I got this. I know that I can go to this bar. And I know that like, yep. I'm not going to be triggered. Yeah. Um, I see them back in the program within two weeks. Yep, yep, yep. And generally, when you ask them, at least in my experience, generally, when you ask them, that was not why they relapsed. There was something else that occurred that caught them off guard. Because they tested themselves in the bar. And maybe the bar was never really a problem. So they've identified the wrong triggers. Absolutely. That's something I explored with him where it was like, well, you would go to the bar after you fought with your partner. So you're not fighting with your partner because your partner's there and you're having a good time. Everything is great. Exactly. However, like, that's what your pattern is. That's your, your comfort zone is to go there immediately when you're fighting. So of course it's going to be good in a, in a pleasant setting. But... Yep. That's exactly it. So the bar is not the trigger. It's the fight. Yeah, I absolutely agree. Yeah. So, and that's what I mean. And clients misidentify triggers all the time. So then when they go out and they test their recovery, <laughs> you're testing the wrong thing, dude. And you're setting yourself up. So anyway, just a little fun here. All right. So here's the other thing with relapse prevention. Obviously, um, we're approaching, um, all, okay, so AA and smart recovery, chances are you're doing that throughout the uh, throughout this process, right? Um, but when it's getting to the late stage and they're going to be approaching termination, you want to make sure that they're connected with some kind of outside uh, community support group of, of some 
kind, whether it's AA, NA, smart recovery, um, a church, whatever it is that the client wants, you know, to focus on. And then here's the other thing too, that's important. Um, having the client to continually examine his own locus of control. And so that may require some psychoeducation, teaching the client about the different the difference between an internal locus of control and an external locus of control, right? And then, um, for example, having responsibility for his or her own behavior, right? All right. <clears throat> and then there's the termination stage. <clears throat> so earlier I was talking about termination. I have a question. Have a yes. Question. So because I've heard that terminology before, internal and external locus of control. Can yes. you give an example of internal locus of control? So internal locus of control is an, a person that experiences that has a high level of self-efficacy. In other words, they believe that they can accomplish certain things, right? So a problem comes up, um, they have self-efficacy, their internal locus of control. It's like, you know what, I, I have the resources to deal with this, right? I'll give you another example. So let's just, um, I use this with my psychology students. So my psychology students come in and they take an exam and two of them fail it. And the first person that fails it says, ah, oh, the professor used trick questions um, or he didn't really go over this well or um, the test was unfair, right? Um, so that would be an example of somebody having an external lo locus of control. In other words, he failed the test because of things outside of himself. The other person who failed the test with an internal locus of control might go, you know what, I really didn't study that hard. Um, you know, I set si a time for studying and, and I, I binged watch, um, you know, Ozark instead, right? And next time I'll study better and I'll do better on the exam. That's the difference between someone with an internal locus of control and an external locus of control. External locus of control, sometimes these, the, the individual does not accept responsibility for his own behavior. Person with an internal locus of control generally does accept responsibility for their own behavior. And that's, that's a simple view. I mean, that's a simple example. <clears throat> Any other questions? All right, so on to termination. This is where we say goodbye to the client. And you'll recall I had said earlier that when it comes to clients, um, they may do fine. You might have a client um, that they come in, uh, they follow all the rules, they, can, they collaborate with their treatment planning, they might even be, you know, um, modeling appropriate behavior and leading in group, you know, doing all the right things. And then all of a sudden it comes time, they're almost to the end. And then they either start messing up or they use, or they do something that delays their termination, right? We often call it self-sabotage. And I'll be honest with you, I hate that term. As a clinician, I'm like, no, self-sabotage is just too generic of a term. Let's get down to the causes and conditions. What is actually happening? client didn't self-sabotage. They experienced some anxiety. They experienced some fear. They didn't know how to handle a situation, right? Um, <clears throat> so when it comes to transitions like that, we as clinicians should always be on the lookout for that, right? And be prepared. And I like to talk to clients about that. I don't even tell them, say, hey, you know what? In my experience, a person, you know, you're, you're about to complete. How do you feel about that? right? Um, sometimes people get uncomfortable, um, not sure what they're going to do. All of a sudden, they're losing all of this support that they've had, right? Um, and that's why it's really important that we as, as programs and counselors are easing people into the community, into those resources, and weaning them off us so that that transition 
is, is much easier. If we're not doing that, and then they feel like, oh, you know what, I'm going to graduate, and all of a sudden I'm cut off. That might be a scary feeling for some people. So it's up to us to kind of like work, work our way through that. Um, but in the termination stage, you're going to be reviewing the client's progress and treatment. Um, emphasize that to maintain the, uh, the, the changes that they must use their relevant status. Uh, I am really having trouble talking tonight. Strategies, right? So everything that they've been learning. Um, this is a good time to like re review all of that, rehearse that um, with the client. Um, and another thing I like to do um, is also, you know, this is where a lot of positive affirmations can be very helpful. Um, expressing their, your, the confidence that in their ability to, um, uh, to do this. And also, let them know that the door is always open for future treatment, referral needs. Here, even we even tell them, hey, come back and visit us, right? I had a client I hadn't seen in about a year and he stopped in and, um, you know, just, just coming in for that. And then, of course, if your program is set up to do this, this is great if you can do it, um, but booster sessions. So in other words, after a period of time of counseling, the, the official counseling may end, but three months later, you may make an appointment for them to come in and review their relapse prevention plan. That, that's called a booster session, right? Um, you might do that at three, six, and nine-month intervals or whatever it is that you and the client um, come up with, but it's not the same rigorous counseling schedule that they've been going through. Booster sessions are often a great idea. Um, the other thing is, is you want to ensure that there's aftercare or some kind of support system in place. Um, now, our program is set up with aftercare built in. Um, and the way we do aftercare is exactly as I was describing earlier. So the treatment ends, aftercare begins, and they get weaned off of coming here to the program or participating in the program, um, you know, as much. They come here maybe once a week, right? Um, as opposed to four times a week, for example. Um, all right. And then, oh, and this is what I was just talking about, right? Identifying and addressing feelings that the client might have about termination. Sometimes clients can experience abandonment issues. There have been times where I've seen this happen with clients in the past where Issues come up at termination that never came up throughout all of treatment. And this may be another opportunity to help intervene um, and work with that client. All right. Any, any questions before we move on to SMART goals? And in the book, uh, SMART is rearranged to M-A-T-R-S. I actually, I like saying smart goals. Um, I kind of grew up on that. <clears throat> Professor, yes, can sir? I ask if there's a difference between aftercare and a booster session? <sighs> aftercare tends to be a little bit more frequently attended, whereas a booster session may be scheduled months out. So in other words, you may not see the client for three months. And then after that three month, you may not schedule them again uh, for another six months, right? So you and the client will determine that. That's not really aftercare in the sense like, as I was describing here. Um, so like a lot of programs have aftercare where there's still like weekly check-ins and, and the client is still a little bit more involved with, the, with that program. Um, Another form of aftercare could be, considering this, where a person in residential then moves to an IOP, and then from an IOP to, uh, uh, from in IOS, I should say now, intensive outpatient services to outpatient services, and then to, um, to aftercare. So aftercare, that's a term that, depending on where you are in the system, 
If you're residential, you're aftercare, you might consider aftercare outpatient services. Does that make sense? Um, well, I'm, I'm just thinking that if I were to say to my supervisor, hey, John, I'm giving a booster session to this one client, he might say, why in the hell are you giving hours away to someone that is no longer a client? You know, once you write the discharge. Exactly, planning. yes. So and I'd get in trouble. <laughs> you know, yes, I'm just yeah, yes, you would. Um, and that is the drawback to the way our system is set up. And that's a shame. Yeah. Um, because you're absolutely right. Uh, um, not all programs are set up for booster sessions. I yeah. will tell you that my program manager and I have worked with former clients. They've come in. Uh, as a matter of fact, I did um, um, a, a booster session with a former client who's been gone for about seven or eight months. Um, and I did it over the phone with him. Um, and then it involved family stuff. So he sent his son to me. <laughs> so I did a little oh, mini wow. session with him and then did some referrals. Wow. Uh, because you're right, I can't spend too much time doing booster sessions because no, we don't get paid for that. You're, yeah. you're absolutely right. Anyway, so, thank you. Yeah, so don't suggest that to your, to your uh, supervisor <laughs> that you'll do that. The reason why I brought it up is because booster sessions exist and you should know about them. People do do booster sessions. Professor? Yes. So also with my, um, um, a counselor that I had a while ago um, through an outpatient program, um, I don't necessarily do booster sessions with her, but every like once or twice a month, we will email back and forth like a day at a time, you know, mm -hmm. and I check in with her. And I think that's one of the added things that have helped me stay clean because I, you know, I have my sponsor, I have my support group, but I also have the counselor that watched me walk through a lot of stuff. And so she'll either initiate it or I'll initiate it. So it's not necessarily that she's taking time away from her day, but she's answering an email. Yes. yes. You know, and there has been a few times she's called me, you know, cause I've asked for things that are like too much to put in an email. It's just easier to talk to. So I think that's also another way to quote unquote, have a booster session. Right. And, and here's, here's the, I went back a couple of slides here, right? Um, because this phrase right here, leave the door open for future, it says treatment, but also future contact. So the client may not need treatment. They might just need a phone call, right? So I always, me personally, I always, please stop in and see me. Give me a call on the phone right? Um, absolutely. You leave that door open for your clients. Yes. All right. So I'm going to move forward back to SMART goals. Okay. So SMART stands for specific, measurable, attainable, realistic, and another R that you may use is relevant. So it's either realistic or relevant and time bound. Okay. So we're going to go through this and, and end on this and then, um, uh, Monica, if you're still here, we'll have you do your presentation um, and then we'll end the class. Um, all right, so moving on to SMART. All right, well, I already said this. SMART means specific. So what is specific? So here's an example. I'm gonna run a marathon in less than four hours. I'm gonna earn $1,000 more. I'm going to create a, net, a resume by the next session. I'm going to get down to a waist size of 32 inches. Oh, how I wish. Um, attend three meetings a week, right? So these are very specific. So sometimes you'll have a client and he'll come in and they'll say, well, what's your goal? Well, I want to have a better life. That is vague. It's huge and it's not very specific. So you might have to break that down for a client. Okay, so when you say a better life, tell me more about that. What does that mean? So in helping clients become specific, sometimes it can be a little work for you in the beginning, helping them break that down. 
um, I actually teach my clients smart goals. And every week um, I ask them, you know, what's your recovery goal for the week? And then I make it to give them to me in a smart goal. And if it's vague, I'll tell them, ah, it's a little vague. Can you be a little more specific, right? And what you're doing is you're teaching them how not to be so generalized, right? Um, but it's also important in goal setting. If you don't know what your actual, what your goal actually is, how are you ever going to reach it? So um, it might be a really good goal to run a marathon. Okay. That might sound specific, but this is much more specific. I'm going to train and I'm going to do this in less than four hours. Measurable. So in order to measure something, you have to know where you're starting from. You have to know what the end point is. Um, know what your goals are, right? So if we go back here, I'm going to go back here for a second. Attend three meetings per week. Is that specific? Okay, yes, that's specific. <laughs> is it measurable? Yes. Yes, it's measurable, right? Well, how is it measurable? Well, there's three meetings and per week. in the week, right? <laughs> yes. So, so um, this actually meets just about everything for SMART, right? Um, it's a nice, simple statement and a good example. But, um, but you have to know if you're not attending any meetings, that's your starting point. Um, your end point is, okay, I'm going to be participating in three meetings a week. Um, make a plan for success. So it may not be and going back to that three, attend three meetings a week. And I'm kind of sticking on that because we have a lot of clients and that's always, you know, what they're going to be doing, right? While they're with us. Um, what does it mean to make a plan for success? Well, what's your transportation? Um, what about work? What's scheduling look like, right? So helping them understand that Setting a goal like that means you have to look at some other things, right? And this is also really in uh, a really good um, <coughs> thing to do with clients. One of the things that we like to do here, although I think it's done infrequently, but I still like to do it, is give the clients a calendar. And then they mark their meetings. They mark on their, um, when they get their 30 days, their 60 days, their 90 days. Because now you got a piece of paper and you're looking at it and you have your results right in front of you. Guess what that does? Build self-esteem and self-efficacy, right? So that's what we're looking for there. Um, so tracking those results. Is it attainable? I'll give you an example of something that I've heard that I heard from a client once. I want to earn $10 million within the next five years. That was really his, his goal. And maybe that was attainable. I mean, I, you know, that was in, in the very beginning, I was still doing assessments with him. I didn't know what his experience was. I don't know. Maybe he had his MBA and was a, was a genius, right, in business. Um, but for a lot of our clients, you know, who are, you know, just coming off the street homeless, that kind of a goal may, you know, not be um, realistic, right? In this example, right, so here's losing 10 pounds per week is not realistic, um, not without crystal meth anyway, and, and we're trying not to have them do that. That was a joke. <laughs> um, I know you all are on mute. Um, I laughed. <laughs> <laughs> here's my point, but, uh, uh, but seriously, um, you know, that is not realistic. Losing two pounds a week is realistic. So sometimes you might have to help your client see that, right? Um, the goal should, should be something that's challenging. One of the things that I always tell people, tell my clients, sometimes I'll draw a circle and I'll say, okay, everything inside the circle is your comfort zone. 
<laughs> right? Everything outside the circle is, is your discomfort zone. Where do you think you're going to do most of your growing? Not in the comfort zone, right? Um, so you got to have to make it challenging. Kind of have to push the envelope a little bit. Here's the other thing. It needs to be something that they're really passionate about. Um, and this is another reason why earlier when I was talking about treatment planning and it being uh, really important that the client is collaborating on it. And here's why. Because if it's not their idea, guess what's going to happen? They're not going to meet that goal. They're just not because it's not their goal. Um, so collaboration is, is uh, really important. All right. Is it relevant? Um, in other words, is this goal going to help me right now? So um, engaging with sober support system is relevant if you want to maintain abstinence, right? Um, engaging in relapse prevention planning is relevant if you're going to be able to engage in coping skills and refusal skills, right? Um, practicing things is going to be relevant, right? Um, and then the last thing of T is time bound. So the goal needs to have an exact date when you plan to accomplish it by. So remember earlier we were talking, I used an example of a client might have a long term goal, right? Oh, five years from now, I want to be able to to be doing this, right? And that's great if they have a goal that far. Um, but can we break that down? What can we do now in the short term that's going to support that other goal, right? So you can take a big goal and chop it up, right? You can help a client do that, um, which is my second bullet point here, right? Breaking down the goal into attainable steps along the way. And then, of course, again, you're tracking your progress. And it's time bound because you're going to do it by such and such a date. And then um, I'm not going to show this video. I did post it already on Canvas. Uh, so you can watch it um, if you want. Um, it's just a treatment planning video, two guys talking, and then some clinician uh, review afterwards. It's kind of short. Um, so again, remember, smart. Um, oh, we. If we were in the classroom, we would be doing role play right now, but we're not. So does anybody have any questions? All right. And I'm going to uh, stop the recording and um, have one last bit of business for class, and then we'll be done.